So I, I started getting into nuclear issues back in Ohio in 1978, and as I was discussing at the table over here, uh, I teamed up with a, uh, a Quaker named Polly Brokow. And um, I had gone to a demonstration at the Rocky Flats plant in 1978 and seen Daniel Ellsberg <clears throat> get arrested there uh, to stop the nuclear, the, you know, to protest against the, uh, the missiles and the plutonium pits that were being uh, manufactured uh, at the Rocky Flats plant. That's where they make the, uh, the interior of the, the bang and the bomb, basically, the plutonium. And uh, they did something very important at that demonstration which was after the demonstration itself was over, uh, they took people back to Denver and had a day-long workshop on how to organize your own group. Um, they taught you how to write a press release, you know, the legalistics of starting an organization and emphasize the importance of, of doing something, not just thinking about it and talking about it, which is also important, but uh, to start doing. And uh, I went back to Cincinnati uh, and uh, cast about and ran into Polly uh, because we were concerned, both of us, about a nuclear reactor being built on the banks of the Ohio River called the Zimmer uh, nuclear plant. And um, working with Polly and working with that organization uh, over the years, one thing I learned uh, very quickly was that uh, it, it was an important thing to make a connection with people who actually worked at that facility, at the Zimmer nuclear plant. And uh, funny, they approached us, even though we're an anti-nuclear anti group, um, and they were pro-nuclear, they're building a plant. Well, it turns out they weren't necessarily pro-nuclear, they were construction trades people, they were welders and electricians and whatnot. And in 1979, uh, some of you may recall, we had a minor mishap at a uh, nuclear reactor in Pennsylvania called the Three Mile Island facility where there was a two-thirds core meltdown. And that kind of shook the, the country up. And Cincinnati is not that far from Pennsylvania and Three Mile Island. So uh, interesting thing about that accident is, uh, I don't know who here has seen the China Syndrome. It's a movie. Um, and it stars Jane Fonda and I forget who else. Uh, and it was about a nuclear accident in California. Well, that movie opened the day of the, that the accident started in Harrisburg, um, which is kind of eerie when you think about it. Uh, anyway, uh, our meetings went from 45 folks or so uh, coming to the meetings to the next meeting after Three Mile Island, we had like 1,200 people show up. It was a big meeting. And so we had to change gears and really uh, get, you know, uh, accommodate more people and educate more people about what this was all about, et cetera. Uh, and uh, again, working with the workers uh, gave us the best education. And it turns out that that nuclear plant was, um, uh, the utility had never built a nuclear plant before called Cincinnati Gas and Electric. And they hired a contractor that had never designed a plant and a, a company that had never assembled one. Um, and they did it all wrong. And so we learned uh, from the workers out there that uh, the, the plant wouldn't meet regulations, right? It was uh, that we had a, a way to get in to challenge that plant. Um, beyond usual arguments about uh, no, no place to put nuclear waste, evacuation zones, uh, safety issues, et cetera, which the, uh, the officials at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the agency that regulates nuclear power, uh, had long ago decided they were, those, these weren't big issues. Uh, however, they were compelled to look at the actual safety of the materials and the plant and the workmanship, et cetera, so we got an earful and started working very closely with these workers and managed to stop that plant from opening up. And that was in 1983 uh, that that plant, uh, and that was a lot of work, so I skipped over years and years and years, uh, but 
Suffice it to say, then my attention turned to a facility in Cincinnati that I knew nothing about. Um, and this was like in 1980, and that was called the Fernald Facility. And that was part of the nuclear weapons complex. And Fernald was connected to the Hanford site insofar as it took uranium products from around the nation and refined those products basically into usable forms as uranium for the Hanford site. And uh, I was contacted by a number of workers that worked at the Fernald site and they were on a health and safety strike and um, I went to one of their meetings and I said, so what's your major concern about the Fernald site, which I knew not much about, other than it was there and I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio and didn't know much about it. And they kind of all started unbuttoning their shirts and I was going, what's going on here? Well, they all had stitches running down their chests. They all, all had, had heart issues. And uh, these, these were younger guys. They were in their 40s. And they thought it was odd that they had all had heart issues and other ailments that they attributed to their work there. So they, they saw this site as a big health and safety issue. And uh, I started working on that uh, site and um, working with workers and whistleblowers from that site. And a whistleblower is a worker who decides that they're going to come forward and tell the rest of the world what, what's going on out here. Um, and uh, uh, one of those was a nuclear auditor uh, named Dan Arthur. And he found that, in fact, the Fernald site had been processing uranium contaminated with plutonium. And uh, a little bit of plutonium contamination in the uranium uh, you can process. And the level that's safe was, called, was 25 parts per million, but the uranium they were handling was at 7,000 parts per million. And they weren't protecting the workers. They weren't giving them masks, breathing apparatus. They weren't uh, doing bioassays, looking for if they've inhaled any. Uh, they weren't telling them what they were working with. And uh, this was very upsetting to Mr. Arthur, who was a nuclear quality assurance professional. And it upset me quite a bit and other workers out there. So I managed to talk the 2020 show into doing a special on this site. And uh, we did the interview for this, this show in, in uh, Marina's folks' living room. And I don't know how pleased they were about that. <laughs> being Cincinnatians, but uh, they accepted it. And uh, that show went on and congressional hearings followed. And it kind of broke open the fact that the United States has a very large, well-funded nuclear arsenal machine. And in fact, most people are shocked when I tell them that we have spent, as taxpayers, $5.5 trillion to make nuclear weapons in this country. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of money. Uh, and they're not made at one place. They're made all over the country. Uh, Ohio was just one of the facilities. Actually, there were three facilities in Ohio, in Tennessee, in South Carolina, in Texas, in California, here in, in the state of Washington, in Colorado, in Florida. Uh, so basically, we had a, a very large network of facilities with you know, kind of specialized functions to make nuclear weapons. Well, why are they all over the country? Well, because the United States was paranoid that the Russians would come in and bomb uh, one of the facilities, but they couldn't bomb them all, uh, at least until they got I ICBMs, the intercontinental missiles, and then, uh, of course, you could target a, bu a bunch of facilities. Well, as I learned more and more about the nuclear weapons complex uh, through looking at the Fernald site uh, and to start with, I also learned that we uh, Americans had built about 65,000 nuclear warheads. Now, I, you've seen films of these explosions. They're massive. You know, there's, there's video of, you know, the mushroom cloud raising up over these massive ships, and the ships look like toys next to the cloud, next to this, you know, explosion, and they're just blown over. So 65,000 weapons, it was just crazy. You know, we really went nuts as, as a nation. 
And I'm getting to Hanford here, believe me. But um, it turns out that uh, really most of plutonium that was made for that nuclear arsenal, starting with the very first nuclear bomb, exploded in the desert uh, in New Mexico, uh, was made at Hanford. And the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, the plutonium was made at the Hanford nuclear site, about 200 miles away from here. And that was just the beginning. Uh, it started with, of course, a single reactor called the B reactor, uh, and it grew to uh, include nine production reactors and about four other kinds of reactors on the site for research and, and et cetera. One of those was FFTF, and um, um, we managed to uh, shut that one down or stop it from, from getting a new lease on life. Um, and, and so I just want to mention quickly that today there are no operating production nuclear reactors at the Hanford site, which is good news. But when I first started working on it, uh, they were still in production back in the 1980s. Uh, they still had the end reactor going. They still had Purex, uh, which is where they took the spent nuclear fuel and dissolved that and got the plutonium out of that fuel. Uh, well, for every little speck of usable plutonium, and we don't want them to use it, but it's usable, um, they also had this big, big mass of junk, uh, which we call spent nuclear, is high-level nuclear waste. And there's no use for this high-level nuclear waste. It is simply contaminated garbage. Uh, and what is worrisome about this contaminated garbage is that uh, it's very complicated stuff. It's got 10,000 chemicals in it, and it's got over 100, maybe 200 uh, radionuclides. Um, and some of these radionuclides, radioactive products, are dangerous for uh, very, very long periods of time, much longer than we're used to thinking about. Uh, some of them are dangerous for 300 years. Some of them are dangerous for uh, just a few weeks. Uh, but some of them are dangerous for uh, a quarter of a million years and even 17 million years and, and longer. So um, we're, uh, we're kind of faced with a major challenge here now that we've ended Hanford's nuclear production cycle to make plutonium. We're left with the, the prospect of, of figuring out a way to clean this stuff up to tackle um, some, some, to invent really some methods because we don't have a container that will last for the amount of time that this stuff is dangerous. In the meantime as well, there are a lot of people still working at the Hanford nuclear site. Now, this is a site, I'll, def I'll describe it physically, it's very large, it's about 570 square miles. Um, it's got literally thousands of buildings on it, roads, a huge infrastructure. Um, 9,000 people work there. Uh, at its height, uh, uh, when they were building it, it took 50,000 people to build it. Um, at, at some points in time, just you know, a few years ago, we had 15,000 people working at the Hanford site on the cleanup. And uh, we're not close to cleaning it up. We're not close. In fact, of the radioactive products that we've created stored on the Hanford site, maybe 1%, maybe 2% has left the site and been put into something called burial. The rest of that radioactive contaminant, basically, is, is stored at the site. And most of that uh, most of the more dangerous stuff is stored in these large underground nuclear waste tanks. And uh, these, there's about 200 of these tanks. Uh, they contain 56 million gallons of waste. Um, and a, a spoonful of this waste is lethal, right? So if you put a Dixie cup full uh, in, a, in a large room, like say in a crowded restaurant, everyone would die from the radiation poisoning. Uh, with, within a year of exposure to that little bit amount of waste. Um, so it's, it's uh, unlike materials that we know. Uh, and uh, it's, it has another property, which is, of course, that you can't smell it. You can't see it. 
You can't hear it. You don't sense it. it, it it's emitting an energy that requires special equipment to measure. So it's insidious uh, from that perspective. It's long-lived, you can't destroy it, and uh, you can't sense it. So what that says to me is that we really have to, we have an awesome uh, task ahead of us to make sure that future generations that might forget what Hanford did and what it's about uh, are protected. Uh, they are our children uh, and our grandchildren. And for the Buddhists among us, it's us, right? It, um, we reincarnate. And, you know, we have a, a very, very uh, important task to do what we can uh, with whatever resources we can muster to contain uh, this massive issue. So that's, that's the place of it, and that's the challenge. And I'm with a group called Hanford Challenge. So we, we really think of it as the challenge of Hanford. Um, and the way we're trying to approach it is we recognize that Hanford is a system, and it's been in place for 60, 60 years now, almost 70 years. Uh, it is a military system. It was born out of national security. It was born out of secrecy. Uh, most people had no idea what Hanford did uh, until the first bomb was exploded over Japan. Uh, and then the secret was out as to that, but everything that happened there was still secret. So even, you know, uh, if Dad worked at the Hanford site, he was not allowed to come home and talk to the family about, about what was happening there. And that, that was true all the way up until 1989 when you had security clearances. Um, and they actually, the government had agents in the schools listening to the conversation of kids, and if, and if someone said, my daddy does this, then they were fired. That family was gone. Um, they were just out of town. They were out of a job, no clearance, etc. So they listened to all the phone conversations. So this, this was a, a very weird place, right? And the first whistleblowers I started to work with there in the late 1980s were considered traitors. And I was considered a very suspicious character, even though I was a lawyer, right, because I was helping these people. And I saw myself as vindicating their rights to speak and to warn the rest of us about, you know, very uh, egregious and outrageous environmental issues um, and that they were be being treated very badly. Uh, so uh, as a lawyer working for a nonprofit organization called Government Accountability Project, um, my job was to advocate for them, give them a legal defense, um, and try to make change happen out there. And we did this through lawsuits, and we did this through congressional hearings and lots of media exposure. And uh, uh, we had some very exciting cases. Uh, one of the first cases out there involved a, a nuclear auditor named Casey Rood. And uh, Casey... Um, was hired as window dressing, right? So he worked in the uh, commercial nuclear industry as an auditor. He was professionally trained. And they brought him in. He was their first professional auditor out there who actually knew what the rules were for, you know, a, running a nuclear operation. And he, he was horrified uh, in 19, you know, in the 1980s uh, when he started doing audits of facilities out there. He says, you're not tracking the plutonium out here. You're not measuring the amount of radioactive stuff going up into the air. But you, don't even, you don't even keep track of where you're dumping waste out into the desert out here. I mean, they were breaking every environmental law, rule, regulation, policy that you can think of. And they thought nothing of it. Why? Because they were immune from accountability. They did not have to follow those laws. No EPA jurisdiction. No state of Washington jurisdiction. No OSHA inspections. It was all internal. Uh, so when I arrived on the scene, I was an unwelcome figure. Um, you know, of course I wasn't allowed to go on the site, but I did go to visit people in their homes. And when I did, there was a government agent parked outside, sometimes walking back and forth on the sidewalk, talking into a walkie-talkie. Um, I don't know to who, 
but just reporting on who I was seeing and uh, who I was talking to. And those people who were brave enough to kind of contact me and step forward and testify in Congress and uh, be in the media, be on 60 Minutes or whatever, they were ostracized. So people wouldn't talk to them. They were radioactive themselves. And uh, some of them had to move out of town. And um, some of them had, you know, their kids had problems at school. Uh, if they had business, small businesses, they were blacklisted. In fact, some of the churches would advocate blacklisting Casey and, and his yogurt shop after he lost his job out there. And, um, you know, uh, this, this was kind of the fate of people. Some people, you know, at, their families fell apart because of the stress of blowing the whistle. Um, and, and this, we had numerous people coming to us despite all of that and taking on this burden, not because whistleblowers were getting rich, not because there's any reward in it, but because it was the right thing to do. Uh, and they were personally and professionally offended. Um, they were outraged. They were bothered. Uh, they were morally just, they just couldn't take it. This is wrong. This is so wrong, what was happening out there. And their stories uh, that they told in public really uh, caused a lot of changes to the Hanford site, to the point where plutonium production ended, to the point where they, the contractors had to reform how they treated their own employees. Um, so when I started at Hanford, it was in the 1987 time frame. It was still in production. Today, no production is going on, and they are in cleanup mode. They have a long way to go on the cleanup, but everyone at least is now pulling for that cleanup to happen. So we've turned a corner in that largely the community has given up on a nuclear mission um, at Hanford. It's over. Party's over. We're going to have to figure out something else to do. And in the meantime, we've got this cleanup that has to happen. And most people I know out there are on board with that, which is great. Now, of course, there are a few people that I know who are railing against that and fighting. And you know, some parts of the community, they'd like to put in small modular reactors because they're small. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's not let that happen. So uh, that's, but that's a, a fight for, for the future. It's not a fight for today. I don't think it'll happen, frankly. But we've got to keep an eye on it. Uh, really what we need to do at this point is, is change the mindset um, like we've been doing. Um, and to that end, we've got uh, several programs that we have in place. One is called Inheriting Hanford. Uh, now think about that. We are going to be inheriting this site, like it or not. Now usually inheritance is, oh, that's a good thing. Well, may maybe not so much this time, but nonetheless, it's coming our way. And um, We've got to get young people involved in this. Uh, and this is a mentorship program that uh, most of my staff is, is younger. They're in their 30s. And um, none of them are here tonight. Uh, I said, no, don't, don't come out. I'll do this. Uh, but they work very, very hard. And the mentorship that they do uh, is they both are mentored. Uh, not just by me, but by other people, and they provide mentoring even for younger people than they are. Uh, so this is a deliberate program, and it's not for Hanford Challenge, it's for Hanford. So uh, we've decided that we're not going to call Hanford they. Uh, we're going to call Hanford us, because it's ours. It's not the Tri-Cities. Uh, it is our problem. It is a human problem. And to think of it as, oh, that's the government, or that's their problem over there, is akin to saying, you know, sitting in a rowboat, right? And part of the rowboat is has sprung a leak, and you're saying to the guy on the other end, hey, your, ro your boat's leaking over there. No, you know, we, we've got to own it. Uh, we've got to do something with this. Um, and so that's that's one tr part of the transformation that we're, we're trying to make happen out there. Uh, we started a... Um, a council to work with the contractors so that when workers um, look like they're about to get in employment trouble for standing up and raising concerns, that they can go to this council 
and have their issues worked out through mediation uh, and preventing litigation. Uh, and I'm on that council and I, I name other people to be on the council. The contractors name their people to be on it and there's some independent members. And I never thought this thing would work, but it, it has. It's worked now for 20 years and it's had over 150 cases that we've resolved, every single case. And it's quite extraordinary. Uh, and it's because it's very good at listening and, you know, we take our time. Um, we, you know, we argue a lot behind the scenes, uh, but in the end, uh, we do what we think is best to resolve that, and all the parties accept it. And the worker doesn't have to accept the mediation, right? So they can say, oh, I want to go sue, but I'm not aware of anyone that's gone and done that. Um, the company, on the other hand, agrees to accept the recommendations as their price of entry to this council. So, uh, you know, if, if they think they can delay things, by sending it through this council, then that's not going to happen. So they've agreed up front that they're going to implement the recommendations of this council. So that's another thing that we've done that's transformational. It's, it's something that is important to do and, and, and get beyond the, oh, you know, you're bad and we're going to sue you and make you do things. Uh, that doesn't work, right? It's like the, uh, the story we just heard uh, about the building of the bridges. We've got to build a bridge all the way from Seattle over there uh, and from Portland over there, and from Washington, D.C., uh, and we're working on doing that, even as we have to stand in the truth of what it is out there. So, and we're one of the few organizations that can actually do that because we don't have jobs connected to it. Uh, we don't have deadlines we have to meet. Uh, you know, Hanford is now a big legal morass. It's a big mess. Um, the state of Washington does have jurisdiction now. The EPA has jurisdiction. There's regulations flying each which way. There's thousands of laws that apply. And there's Congress, which is shelling out about $2 billion a year. That's right, $2 billion a year uh, for the Hanford cleanup, and that will keep going for another 60, 70 years, maybe longer. Um, we continue to work with whistleblowers. Not all the contractors out there <coughs> are willing to be on this council. Um, some of them you see in the paper um, or on TV. There's, we have a table back there with some of that, some of the news articles from USA Today and <coughs> Los Angeles Times. And, um, uh, you know, so we, we are doing edgy stuff and we are, we're doing a lot of soft stuff as well uh, with the idea that we're going to be doing this for, <coughs> excuse me, a long, long time and far beyond my lifespan, probably far beyond the uh, working lives of, uh, of the staff that's currently on board. So where are we today with Hanford? Um, I talked about those 200 or so tanks. There's, you know, the detail-oriented among you, there's 177 of these tanks. 149 of them are old tanks that are single-shelled, and they a third of those, or most of those, have actually leaked. Um, they have failed. They have holes in them, and they're not working anymore, and they're beyond their design life. Um, Hanford in the 1970s built, built newer tanks, um, and those are called double shell. So they have two walls, and those are thought to be more robust. In fact, the Department of Energy has gone on record as saying, these will never fail. Never say never. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, the one of those double shell tanks was found to have a leak. And um, the DOE has still not admitted this. They, they kind of take their time in admitting bad news. Good news goes fast, but, you know, press releases, fanfare, you know, bands, marching bands, airplanes with banners. But the bad news, someone else has to break the bad news out there. And that sometimes is us and sometimes it's somebody else. But um, this, this tank is definitely leaking. And it's, and it's a wake-up call because uh, these tanks, we're, we're going to count on these tanks to hold the waste for another 45 or so years before we actually get to emptying the tanks and turning that waste into mixing it with glass 
and then putting that radioactive glass deep underground somewhere someday. So that's kind of the plan for Hanford is to take that nuclear waste and treat it. It's called treatment. And uh, the, the other issue is that that big treatment facility that they're building out there has major problems. And the whistleblowers now coming out <clears throat> are their top scientists and managers who are saying this thing's not going to work. Um, it's, it's been too corrupt and too incompetent and things are just so wrong out here. <clears throat> and it's 65% complete and 90% designed, but they've stopped the design. They've stopped the construction. And they're slowly coming to realize that these whistleblowers, these top technical people, are correct. And that's not good news. Um, but it is, but it is. Uh, what do we do from here? We don't know. Uh, nobody actually knows what to do from here. I've talked to all of these technical people one-on-one, -on -one, and I said, well, is the plant salvageable in some way? Can we fix this or that and make this happen? And one guy says, oh, yeah, we could do this. We could build this conditioning facility that will cost another billion or two and have it over there, but it won't treat all the waste now, and blah, blah, blah. Another one says, nope, it's toast, the whole thing. Just wait for the funeral. Another one says, well, you can't use that part of the plant, but over here you could use this. And what that tells me is there's really no agreement uh, about what to do next. So there has to be some coming together, some dialogue, and it's not necessarily just a technical problem, right? So there's politics involved, there's policy, uh, there's, there's obviously engineering problems, uh, but Hanford still has a habit of retaliating against those people who come forward with bad news. And until they fix that, then we're going to continue to see problems out there and facilities that get built with bad designs and poor shoddy construction because people don't feel safe in pointing out what those problems are. So that's one of our most important roles is I learned this lesson back in the, back in the 70s and I still do it, which is listen to those folks, give them a place to land, be their ally, give them a legal strategy and Help them be a mouthpiece, right? So help them talk to the rest of us, inform Congress and the media and folks like you what's going on out there so that we can foster some kind of change that way too. So that's what we do along with the Inheriting Hanford and some of the other stuff I haven't talked about. But uh, it, it's kind of a multiple strategy, but we're in it for the long haul. And we've had a lot of successes and we're going to continue to having successes. And it's very important that folks like you know what's going on out there and we enjoy your support. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having me come out and, and listen to me today. I'm going to wrap it up here because I notice I've gone on pretty long and see what questions you might have and what, what else you want to talk about. So thanks very much for listening. Well, okay, so you're talking about the underground plumes of chemical and radioactive waste. They're pretty big. Um, not only because the tanks have leaked about a million gallons, but because there was a, a, a fairly stupid practice on the part of Hanford. It was expedient to dump liquid waste onto the soil. Um, in very large areas, they called them trenches and cribs. Um, a crib is actually a hole in the ground that you line with gravel and sand, gravel and sand. Now, if you've ever dug a drainage trench, what do you put in it? Gravel and sand. I mean, that's what it was designed to leak. And so as a result, there's an estimated 80 square miles of contamination below the site. That's the bad news. The good news is that uh, apart from the tank waste, most of that waste was 
not as dangerous as what's in the tanks. So, you know, um, uh, that, and the other part of good news is that it's, uh, it's very dry and the groundwater in most places is probably 200 feet below the, the surface. Um, and to an extent, the soil has acted as a filter and has soaked it up. Yes, there's groundwater contamination, but there's a whole lot more still in the ground. So there's an opportunity to recover that waste that's in the soil um, and, uh, and, of course, deal with the tanks. The harder part is, what do you do about that leaked tank waste? That's very dangerous stuff. And we are advocating, and the state of Oregon and others are advocating, that, that those tanks be actually removed where necessary, where there's a, been a leak and the soil below the tanks dug up. Um, it's called clean closure. Uh, the Department of Energy officially wants to empty the tanks, put concrete in them, and walk away without dealing with the waste below the soil. That is a fight. We are having that fight, and we will win that fight. They will stick with that for a while. We will win. The public is on our side on this. The state governments are on our side, and eventually we will prevail on that issue. Uh, we will lose some time in the process, uh, but some tanks, those tanks that are covering over leaks, uh, will be removed and that soil will be dug up. And I'm standing here today because, uh, saying that because I know there are a lot of other very committed people, many of them younger than me, who feel exactly the same way and they are tenacious and they are stubborn and they are smart. Um, so we're going to continue this fight uh, and, and I hear you and I think there will be damage. Um, and there's continuing damage. There's damage from Fukushima, there's da damage from Chernobyl. Uh, etc. We are creating these very large landscapes of contamination. We've got to stop that. Uh, we've got to reverse it. Um, and I, I think that enough people will become aware of it and it will be reversed. But it's going to be hard. This, this. In the empty closure process you just described, where would we remove waste go? We're going to remove, remove waste what? You described empty closure. That is removing the waste material and sequestering somewhere right. else. Right. Where would that somewhere else be? We don't have a location at this point in time. Uh, it was going to be a site in Nevada called Yucca Mountain. The, uh, it turns out that Yucca Mountain was chosen hastily in a political process where the U.S. Congress said, Who's the most powerless state? Hmm, that would be Nevada. And <clears throat> Nevada said, hey, not here, not here. And Congress mandated that there would be a nuclear waste repository about 80 miles outside of Las Vegas. Las Vegas was not that happy with this announcement. And that whole state has dedicated itself to stopping this, this site from going forward. Well. Uh, fortunately for Nevadans, um, science was also on their side. So, as you know, as opposed to saying that'll be the site and the science will prove it, that didn't work out that way. The science actually uh, went the other way and said, "Oh, hey, you've got hot water that's been upwelling through this mountain in the last 3,000 years. Wait a second, it's supposed to be dry for 100,000 years." And recently, a judge said, "What? Where'd you get that number?" How about a million, a million years? It's got to be dry. And Yucca Mountain does not meet that criteria. So the uh, Obama administration canceled Yucca Mountain. Um, yes, it was a political deal with Harry Reid, who happens to be the most powerful person in the Senate from Nevada. Uh, and my response to that is, yeah, well, what do you expect? It was born out of politics, and it died from politics. And where's the science? When are we going to talk about the science? So now there's a Blue Ribbon Commission looking at where you put it. My own personal opinion is that you put it in granite. 
and there are only a few places in the world with granite deposits big enough that have been, you know, undisturbed long enough where you could actually um, consider that. One of those is as fact, there's, be, uh, there's a repository being built right now in Finland called Ankalo. Uh, very interesting movie, by the way, uh, called Into Eternity that talks about that. And so they're building this the shaft down into the granite and they're planning to put their nuclear waste in that repository and walk away. And they're expecting it not to be disturbed. Uh, some of the better minds in science say, we don't know uh, what to do with nuclear waste, so you should have a monitored retrieval storage. So you should have a, a place to put this waste where it's dry, it's as good as we can get it, given our technology today, but let's not put it where we can't retrieve it because we may come up with technologies in the future that are better than what we have today. Uh, of course, the important part is stop making this stuff, right? What, what are you doing? You shouldn't be making another ounce of this stuff, you know, unless it's for some really, you know, good humanitarian purpose. And there's medical isotopes. Now, I think most medical isotope use, I, I think, is misused, but there's, I'm sure, you know, some technologies where I would agree to it, for instance, but most of that's a drop in the bucket compared to what a nuclear plant makes in a year's time, what, 20 metric tons of uranium, uh, and we've got 600, 700 reactors in the world. I mean, it's, uh, we've got to reverse that. We've got to shut those things down and uh, stop making this stuff because uh, it's, it's terribly unethical and irresponsible to be making a material that you don't know how to dispose of or protect future generations from. And mostly we're doing it for what? Air conditioning? I mean, sorry, not a good enough reason. Anyway, yes, yes, yes. Is there any chance that maybe that Dell can be replaced by a different contract? I see you've been reading the news articles. Yes, I think that the government is actually moving in that direction. Um, there's been a revolt at Hanford uh, in the engineering and technical staff. And it started with the contractor, some contractor staff, but now it's spread to the Department of Energy technical staff. And their chief technical officer, a guy named Gary Brunson, recently wrote a scathing, essentially career-ending memo um, that was, uh, itself was fairly short. Uh, I think it was 14 pages, but then he had thousands of pages of attachments detailing exactly how Bechtel has been inept, incompetent, has misled the government, uh, has self-served itself through, you know, designs that were unneeded, through equipment that was, I mean, it was just an outrageous. It was, it, uh, to read this thing, it just made your blood boil because this is so much of our money for such an important project, and they were getting basic things just wrong. It's just, and it's, they need to be fired. That's my opinion. Uh, they need to be sent down the road. And I should hasten to say that this is the, this is Hanford's fourth attempt to make this facility. And it's failing. And what's wrong here? I mean, the one thing that's been the constant through all those four failed attempts has been the, the Department of Energy. The system is broken. We need another way to do this that's not the same people who made the mess in the first place. Yes, ma'am. Um, my brother retired from Hanford, and my nephew still works there. Uh, and um, I'm aware also through other means that of the other environmental damage that has already occurred, such as the radioactive rabbit, but also uh, radioactive deer uh, and uh, the underground plume. Some have reached the Columbia River, which is the drinking water source from the Tri-Cities all the way down to uh, Astoria. Um, the Native American uh, reservations all, all along the Columbia, both Oregon and Washington, um, have the right to hunt game on what was their reservation, now called the Hanford Reservation. 
And um, then I read where, uh, I don't remember who now, uh, said that they're not going to be able to meet uh, the most, uh, the next deadline for cleanup. Uh, do you have any update on that? And what's, what's going to be done about that additional delay? Well, that delay is the waste treatment plant. The facility that's supposed to, everyone calls it the VIT plant because it vitrifies, it's supposed to vitrify the nuclear waste. And that's the facility that the technical staff is in revolt about. Um, it, it's hard to argue with scientists and engineers. When they say it's not going to work, basically you can pretty much count on the fact it's not going to work. So that's the problem that the government has right now is that when it's, its engineering division says, we have a problem, you don't launch, right? You can't. You can't start this thing up. Uh, you have to go back to the drawing board. And uh, that's what the Department of Energy has decided it has to do. So a couple of months ago, it kind of hoisted the white flag and said, you know what? We don't know when this thing is going to open. We don't know how much it's going to cost. We're not sure we can fix all these technical issues. And the state of Washington is furious. It gave up a lot in these last round of negotiations to make sure that this facility was going to open in 2019. Now, it was supposed to open last year. And it was supposed to cost $4.6 billion. Cost today, $13 billion. But no one believes that anymore. The cost is probably going to be twice that at this point, um, and if, if they can do it, if they can salvage the plant. Uh, privately, people on the inside are saying, we're just waiting for the funeral, um, meaning it's over. Uh, and I don't know if it's that bad. Uh, I, you know, I don't think I'm qualified to say whether or not it can be salvaged. Uh, I know that there are some very serious people on the inside who think it is that bad. Um, where do we go from here? Well, again, I, I think, uh, who, who was it that said doing the same thing the same way and failing uh, over and over again is the definition of insanity. And really it's up to Congress and the administration, which, you know, holds the reins of power on these kinds of things, to say, well, okay, after four attempts and billions of dollars and nothing, then we've got to do it differently. Uh, and there are some ideas floating around out there about that, what that looks like, who would do it. Uh, I think, you know, taking the Department of Energy out of the driver's seat on this, on this plant and over, from this cleanup and putting some other organization in there um, and who you might say, well, Britain has a cleanup agency. That's all that, that's all that agency does. It's not connected with the military. Not, you know, and you know, uh, I think that might be what you need to do is to get an organization that's very mission focused on what does it take to make a cleanup happen. Uh, and if it's done behind the scenes, quietly, uh, no transparency, no community buy-in, well, you've got a recipe for disaster right there. Uh, so they need to change a lot of habits uh, and a lot of ways of doing things uh, if they're going to get anywhere. So. Sure. sure. And, and, you know, the lawsuits Again. bring about a systemic change. No. You know, what's a judge going to do? So a judge is going to say, well, well, go clean it up. I mean, the Department of Energy says, but we don't know what to do, Your Honor. Because that's the truth. It is the truth. And, you know, the fact is we are stuck with an agency that doesn't know how to do it. They hired a company that raped the taxpayer, sorry, right? And uh, just took over this project and ran it apparently for their own benefit uh, and produced a plant that's just not going to work. And again, who let that happen? The Department of Energy. They paid someone to think for it. They made them the design authority and the design agent and said, tell us when it's working. And Bechtel has just kept coming back and saying, well, we need a bit more money. It's going to take a little longer to the point where now it's, we're at end game, right? Now it's coming to an end. 
So I, I think the Department of Energy will probably take some stern action against Bechtel. They'll probably replace them as a design authority. I don't know that. I'm just guessing. Um, and they're going to go to Congress with a new bill. And Congress is going to say, what the heck? You're going to spend more to treat this waste, le treat less waste less effectively, and you have no place to put it. What's wrong with this picture? Right? How much have we spent on your cleanup at Hanford? Well, so far, about $35 billion since 1989. And what do we have to show for it? Not much. So where they have had success is they have, along the river, they had a lot of reactors, and they had a lot of contaminated areas. Um, they were threats to the river. Uh, there was one area that was called the... Uh, uh, K basins, and it had several tons, it had actually thousands of tons of spent nuclear fuel in it, and it was a thousand yards from the river. Well, it turns out that that, that that fuel was aging and crumbling and sludgy, and was a lot of sludge was building up, you know, underneath, and it could catch fire underwater. Well, how do you put out a fire underwater? So that, that was a, a, a very urgent and important um, <clears throat> project, and they just finished, right? So good, a uh, good success. So the sludge is out, the K-basins are cleaned up, they're gone, they're not a threat, you know, they can have a flood there, they can have an earthquake there, we don't have to worry about the K-basins anymore. Uh, so that was good news. They just put in a massive groundwater treatment plant that scales up their ability to treat contaminated groundwater, which is how you do it, right? You pump it up, you run it through big filters, you know, the filters capture the radionuclides and the chemicals, and you return the clean groundwater back to the groundwater. That's going to take decades. But they put in this massive facility. That's good news. So they are doing some things that are good. Um, they've cocooned all the reactors out there, um, meaning that they've, you know, removed all the unnecessary facilities. Now it's just the core. It's got a special roof on it. They don't have to go do anything to it except check it once a year. They'll let the radioactivity die down in these things. And in you know, 50, 75 years, they'll cut them up and move them to a disposal site away from the river. Right now, they're a little too hot to do that. Um, so the cocooning is the best we can do for the time being. They're taking apart the uh, plutonium finishing plant. They're almost done with that. That's where they conducted a lot of their uh, plutonium finishing work, of course, to make it plutonium into pits. It was one of their most contaminated facilities, and they should have it cleaned up in bare earth uh, within a year or two. Uh, so yeah, there, there's, there is certainly progress. Do, do we need more? Yes. And do we need to attack the bigger things? Yes. But there is, again, reason for hope. There are things going on. Yes, ma'am. I want to get back to the very beginning of Get our facts straight for a possible Raging Granny song. Okay. And you said five, I think you said five and five, five and five tenths trillion dollars been sent, spent so far on nuclear uh, weapons. Failed to get the last nuclear weapons. Word out to it. make nuclear weapons. And that was done as a Brookings Institution study released in 2002. That's. that's Weapons. 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 Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, it seems like those tanks are pretty expensive to build and have a limited capacity, but when they're leaking, they have like an unlimited capacity. <laughs> so I was wondering, in your all your dealings with whistleblowers, is there evidence that they were filling tanks? that they knew were leaking? There was a tank in 1966 that blew up. And it's uh, Tank 105A. And um, actually, the Raging Grannies could do a song about this tank. They've already written some clever Hanford worker wrote a, a ballad, the Ballad of 105A. And I think we have it on our website. It's hilarious. And um, uh, basically, it's like Tank 105A, she 
bump she exploded and blew it all away and because uh, it's a funny song but uh given the subject matter not that funny uh they had a steam explosion in the tank um apparently there was a leak in the sidewall of the tank liquid went out down and under well the waste under the tank uh at the bottom of the tank is sludgy and full of plutonium and strontium and cesium and some of that stuff not only generates radioactivity but generates thermal heat as well. So it's very hot. When that liquid came into contact, even you know, through that hot steel that was above the flash steam flash point, it flashed into steam. The tank, you know, went went crazy. There was a large geyser of radioactive waste uh, that went up over the tank, 70 feet into the air for a half hour. It blew a, a hole the size of a Volkswagen bus in the bottom of the tank. All the liquid ran out. The response of the site was, uh-oh, because that really, really hot waste could literally just start. It could start uh, just having repeat explosions. Uh, it could reach criticality. Uh, it it's, was very bad news. So they ended up pouring an estimated... 500,000 to a million gallons of what they called cooling water into that tank for 10 years, 15 years, something like that. Um, and they never called that a leak. So when you hear there's a million gallons that have leaked out of the tanks, there's a million gallons leaked out of one tank, right? And we've had over 67, 68 leakers out there. Uh, but, you know, Hanford math isn't always the same as our math. So uh, they, they just didn't choose to. So that's one instance where you're right. That, that happened. Apart from that one example, I don't know. I've not heard that. Uh -huh.